namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang saranang gacchami dhammang saranang gacchami sangang saranang gacchami Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gacchami, dutiyampi dhammang saranang gacchami, dutiyampi sangang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gacchami, tatiyampi dhammang saranang gacchami, tatiyampi sangang saranang gacchami. So, so nice to uh, see everybody here today on uh, Tuesday evening, uh, now the uh, 10th. I guess of uh, of July, time is flying by, and we had uh, two questions. I guess the first one was about once your mind uh, uh, gets calm, how do you know if it's calm enough to move to contemplation? And then the related question with that one was, is that the case that you is a step where you make your mind calm and then move to contemplation? Is that right? And then the second question was uh, if you feel a kind of pleasant sensation, kind of tingling sensation, it feels nice, and uh, focus on it and it goes away, what to do with that. Yeah. And so these are kind of uh, two uh, somewhat interrelated uh, questions. So uh, the Buddha's teachings on meditation is that, you know, basically what we're aiming for when we meditate is to develop a kind of inner peace. Yeah. This is a kind of inner peace that isn't focused in on external things. Actually, it's something that we access by abandoning attachment to, to external things. And specifically, we let go of grabbing onto things that cause us to have hatred. We let go of you know, grabbing onto hamburgers or kind of uh, <laughs> they call a kama tanha. It's kind of craving for uh, pleasant, uh, pleasant you know, uh, experience, uh, some kind of pleasant uh, uh, experience. And we let go of kind of sloth, uh, t uh, torpor, kind of feeling tired. We let go of doubt, and we let go of uh, anxiety and remorse. So those are the five kind of things that our mind tends to run out and grab to, grab onto, and uh, and that causes us to uh, lose this ability to develop an inner peace. You know? So this kind of things, our mind running out and grabbing to these things. You know, we grab onto these things because. Uh, because they're kind of tantalizing, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about this burger, you know, <laughs> dreaming about the burger, kind of craving the burger, then getting the burger and eating it, and our mind's somewhere else while we eat it. And well, it's somewhere else, and we, f we finish the meal, and we're all full for a little bit, and then our stomach starts, uh, you know, not being so full, and before too long, we're craving for another burger. You know, we can't think of what it's like without this burger. It's the same thing with uh, things that we hate. The things that we hate are often tied together with things that we love. You know? So often, sometimes I hear people uh, talking about kind of politics, you know, is, uh, which in a democracy is something that people need to do. But there can be this kind of uh, you know, virulent, like hate, sometimes like quite a lot of hatred comes up in these political discussions. And one of the reasons is because people have ideals, things they love about the way that a country should be or the way that people should be. They love these things. They crave the experiences when they have these things. And then when somebody or something seems to threaten them, it turns to hatred. This kind of hatred is born from what they call this kind of pema. In Pali, the word is pema, and it means this kind of love based on attachment. You know, so we kind of attach to these things. And when we have this kind of feeling of uh, drowsiness and sleepiness, of course our body needs to sleep. You know, this kind of fact of uh, <laughs> being a human. The interesting thing is that uh, for many of the great meditation masters, as they get better and better at meditation, their need for sleep decreases and decreases. So you can kind of uh, see this yourself if you go on a long meditation retreat, maybe for 10 days. Quite possible that as those days go on, you'll find yourself more and more energized, less need to sleep. And one of the reasons for this is because the things that we go out and grab onto actually sap the energy of our mind. And we go out and grab onto something we really love, you know, some kind of, oh, I love this kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, this idea of whatever political idea it is, you know, and kind of revel in that, you know, kind of, uh, uh, and, you know, go absorb into that. It takes energy, kind of trying to send our mind out to eat this thing, whatever it is, kind of this happy time with, uh, you know, with our <laughs> people uh, that we like or whatever it is. And then when we lose that, it's equally some, something that, uh, or possibly even more so, something that takes energy from us. We hate when we lose the things that we love. And this is something our mind grabs onto to try to keep this experience the same. All of this kind of saps our mental energy, kind of takes it away. And so then sometimes feel like we need a lot of sleep. Yeah? Kind of sleep can also be used in some cases as kind of distraction, kind of blank out for a bit. You know? Kind of uh, if things are a bit too tr tricky, then sleep it up, you know, and they're gone for eight, you know, six or seven hours. So then when we come to meditate in this, we, uh, we put forth effort in our practice, we uh, get our mind centered, this need for sleepiness, you know, kind of disappears. It's sometimes it's something we have to fight against because there's different types of sleepiness. There's a type of sleepiness that comes from the physical needs of the body, like the body is actually, you know, it, it needs to rest, right? But there's also a type of sleepiness that comes when we just don't want to see something. Or not, maybe that's kind of not the right word, but we just want to blank out. Just don't want to be there, you know. And these are two different types of sleepiness. So we have to use our discernment to determine the difference between them. And then we fight against the one type. The type that we, uh, we uh, uh, the type that we just want to blank out. So I remember I came back from uh, Thailand and the monks there were really, uh, when I was in Thailand, the monks there were really rigorous in their practice. So the maximum amount of sleep you could get at a monastery, maximum, if you ran back to your kuti after the evening meditation and literally dropped into your bed was six hours. <laughs> that was maximum, if you did that. <laughs> but nobody did, right? Because I mean, you know, there's other, you have to brush your teeth, and, you know, whatever it is. And when I arrived there, I was just like, what's going on? Like, how are you going to get by on so little sleep? <laughs> you know? And just couldn't believe that it was possible. But in fact, it was possible. So that kind of changed my perception. But then actually later on, I ended up taking that too far and really reducing my sleep way too much and just kind of crashing out. You know, whenever I'd sit down, I'd be kind of, you know, <laughs> head bobbing. It actually ended up hurting my neck one time from falling asleep sitting up. <laughs> so in other words, there's a continuum. And it's something we learn to separate. But when we separate this properly, we separate out this feeling of sleepiness that just comes from wanting to crash out. What we actually get from that is more energy. And this feeling of tiredness that's amazing sometimes can just disappear. We thought we were just totally ready to have a nap. And we stand up and walk around for five, six minutes, and boom, it's gone. It's like, where was that? <laughs> it's kind of overwhelming feeling, right? So this is another thing that we learn to put aside. And then there are these, this other one, these thoughts of uh, what they call udacha kukucha, which means uh, restlessness and remorse. And it's interesting, these two things are kind of tied together in, uh, in the Buddha's teaching, this, uh, this feeling of anxiety, kind of not knowing what's going to happen in the future, but also this feeling of guilt, remorse over bad things that we've done in the past. These kind of two things are tied together in a way, and they're both actually enemies of our concentration enemies of our ability to make our mind settle down. So this is actually an interesting point because if you've grown up in the West, you know, I know I've grown up in the West myself, often one of the spiritual practices that we absorb without even thinking about it is this practice of feeling guilty about ourself. It's because in culturally it's seen as a way of redeeming ourself. You know? So it's kind of a, if you feel guilty or bad enough about something that we might have done, then somehow that undoes the action. Right? But of course this isn't the case. Right? So no matter what type of evil we've done, feeling guilty about it does not undo the action. It's the thing, there's absolutely nothing that can undo the bad actions that we've done. They will have the results in time, but the results are made worse by feeling guilty. Right? It's like somebody who spills a drink in their room, you know, some kind of drink. Okay, now you spilled this milk. <laughs> and you spilled the milk on your carpet. The milk is there. And if we feel guilty about it, 
beat ourselves up, but the milk is still there. <laughs> you know, like, kind of the milk is spilled now. I mean, that's it. You know, we kind of feel guilty about that. We cry, you know, crying over spilled milk is this saying in the West. Says, <laughs> kind of feel guilty about the spilled milk. And it was still there. And the more we feel guilty about it, we sit there feeling guilty. We can't actually clean it up. Just kind of sitting there. We allow it to sit there. It stagnates and gets worse and worse. And, you know, if we don't actually ever clean that up, I mean, our room can become a really smelly place just from that, <laughs> you know, one glass of spilled milk. So the Buddha's advice for this feelings of restlessness and remorse, the remorse portion, is to reflect in this way. I've done bad actions in the past to a greater or lesser extent. That wasn't good. It wasn't good that I did that. But if I felt remorseful about that, then that bad action wouldn't get undone. So then what I should do is determine not to do it in the future and then overcome these feelings of remorse. These, kinds of these feelings of remorse, something we put aside, not to be grabbed onto. And the same thing with what we call the restlessness. You know, this kind of restlessness uh, sometimes gets translated restlessness anxiety, restlessness remorse. It's kind of restlessness, this feeling of kind of uh, not wanting to sit. You know? <laughs> kind of uh, like there's something that got to do, right? So we sit down to meditate. It's like, oh, there's this, you know, one of the first things that happens sometimes is we have these feelings like, I've got these 10 things I need to do right now that weren't that important before, but right now when I sat down to meditate, they suddenly became like the most overwhelmingly important thing that I have to do. <laughs> it's kind of, within this hour, I've got to do them. <laughs> Just can't stay here, right? So there's this kind of a feeling of restlessness. And in some ways, this feeling of restlessness is... Uh, is what we call like a trick of the defilements of our mind. It's kind of, it's similar to anxiety. Sometimes when we have this feeling of anxiety, this feeling of restlessness, it's this idea that if we don't do something right now, or if something isn't happening right now, then it's just terrible. The world's just going to end. You know? <laughs> Nothing good's going to come of that. But the another amazing thing, similar to restlessness and remorse, when we fight against this for a bit. Okay, I mean, of course, if there's a fire in here, we all you know, get up and file out the door in an orderly fashion, according to the fire drill standards. <laughs> but uh, if there's no fire, if it's just, I've got to call this person that I forgot about, okay, you know, can this wait an hour, right? Like if I was in a movie right now, would this, you know, would I wait the hour to call them, you know, right? Like if I was in, you know, a meeting right now, would I wait the hour to call them? And often, most, you know, 99% of the time, with these kind of thoughts, the answer is going to be yes. Yeah. And this is a trick of the mind in the same way sleep, the, this need for sometimes wanting to crash out excessively is a trick of the mind. Because the amazing thing is that when we feel like we just can't stay, we can't sit, and we do, sometimes this feeling disappears almost immediately. This feeling of kind of... Uh, restlessness. And similarly with anxiety, it's like sometimes these two things get kind of linked. It's kind of feeling like I've got to do something or something's got to happen, you know, right now. Because sometimes when we think we have this projection in the future, something uh, absolutely terrible will happen, you know, <laughs> if I don't do this right now or something doesn't happen right now. But then, you know, if we just sit with that, you know, don't follow that, we take the necessary steps, sometimes it disappears. There's this terrible future that was coming down the road, disappears. One or two steps. So all these things are just tricks of the mind. You know, this is one of the things that we learn when we come to practice. We can't trust every thought that comes into our mind. Just because we have this feeling of wanting the burger. Just because we have this feeling of loving this political view, hating this political view. Just because we have this feeling of sleepiness, just because we have this feeling of restlessness, just because we have this feeling of anxiety, that doesn't mean that it's something we have to follow. Right? It may or may not be something wise. If it's anxiety about a fire, probably wise. <laughs> you know? If it's anxiety about most other things, you know, better to put it aside for the time we meditate. And the last one is what's called doubt or wichakicha, you know? And this comes from, uh, this is usually translated as kind of doubt in the Buddha, you know, kind of doubt that what he teaches actually leads to where he says. And this is something that's not possible to completely overcome until stream entry. 
but it also has uh, other aspects to it. It's basically doubt like, you know, like, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know? It's kind of often something for, uh, for Westerners, right? Or it can be something. What am I doing here? You know, it ties into all these other ones. You know, there's all these important things going on, and I'm here focusing in on myself, you know? Kind of doubt about whether this actually will bring benefit, you know? Doubt about whether focusing on our breath will bring benefit. Doubt about whether practicing morality will bring benefit. Doubt about whether benefits are even really possible. Of all these things come under this category of doubt. You know? So this is a category that's eliminated actually through investigation. And this kind of doubt is something that some people are able to overcome with this feeling of faith. It's basically, they, they develop this faculty where they're uh, intuitively able to uh, kind of see somebody or something and have this very strong faculty of, um, uh, of uh, kind of a f uh, following is maybe not the right word, but uh, they're able to take instructions and take those on really quickly without having to uh, cut them up and evaluate them. Is this right? Is this wrong? So for a person who has this faith faculty, they're able to do that, you know, through different means. This is kind of one of the types of people is called a faith follower in Buddhism. And you can, people who have this faculty really strongly are able to overcome their doubts through their faith. This kind of faculty is very, very strong, and it kind of buoys them up. So actually, I've been, I was just at a Buddhist temple recently, and people kind of practice this uh, Buddha puja, you know, offerings to the Buddha, making these uh, meritorious actions. And when you go into places like this, the energy is very buoyant. It's very kind of uplifting. It's hard to describe. Kind of you stay there for a while, it's kind of uh, very bubbly. You know, you can, you can feel this kind of sense of joy, this joy that comes from faith. Yeah? And so what this is, is, you know, people have these feelings that they get from doing good things, and they're able to project those. This is a good thing. You know, what I'm doing is good. The people who are teaching this are good. They learn to see the good in things. And this carries them forward in faith. And kind of these uh, feelings come up quickly. People who have this faculty strongly can sometimes, I think, possibly let their minds settle down much more quickly because they're very focused on finding the good in things and making that grow. And there's people whose minds are in the other way. You know, they have this faculty of what they call discernment or in the West we call the critical faculty. This is stronger in them. You know, this kind of faculty of discernment. People like this, they actually tend to link more with a hate type of uh, personality. Hatred comes to them more easily Greed comes to them less easily. You know, the people who are kind of more uh, faith-oriented, greed comes to them more easily, hatred more difficult. Mm -hmm. But in any event, we all have these different characteristics, and there is this way to overcome doubt with faith. Another way for people who are uh, more, uh, say, intellectually inclined is through investigation, mm -hmm. through searching for the means of cause and effect. So what this is, is when we see, you know, what we're looking for is, okay, what I'm looking for when I meditate is to find a type of happiness, you know? So then what we do if we're investigating in this way, we look for the smallest potentials, you know? In the same way, if we were, uh, you know, somebody I remember hearing about the Great Depression from my grandfather, you know, when I was young, or even now you can ask him, <laughs> and what it was like. These people had like very little. They would be, Canada then would be considered like a third world country compared to what it is now. And in order to survive, they had to find any source of food they could. Kind of sometimes pulling dandelions from the ditch, you know, uh, you know basically all growing all your own food. Whatever kind of seed they could find of food, they would have to find that and cultivate it in order to make it grow. Yeah. And so in the same way, with, for a person of discernment, it's not always that easy to just have faith in something. It's like, well, what if this is a lie? You know, I don't know this for sure. This could be a lie. So in that case, for that person, they have to investigate through the means of cause and effect. They have to do it like a person who's searching to see if a hypothesis is true. You know? So like the uh, same way as in... Uh, you know, when these people who were hungry, you know, the same way we're all hungry, we're looking for happiness, we want to see if this truly leads to it. So what that means is we have to, for people of discernment, we have to flip the critical faculty somewhat. Instead of trying to disprove something, we're looking to see if we can find potentials that will make, that will grow, like seeds, you know, 
like in the Great Depression, when people were starving, if they found a seed, they would plant that seed and water it and see if it grows. Now, granted, if that seed grows into a weed that you can't eat, not a good seed. Right? <laughs> don't want to cultivate that one again. But what you don't do for if you want to cultivate this uh, overcome doubt through discernment, what you don't do is just look at a seed and be like, where's the plant? You know? I've got this seed here, it's been 10 minutes, no plant, right? <laughs> you, know? it's like, you have to plant that seed and water it. You have to tend to it carefully, and you have to look for the small potential starting from a seed. When we do this, what we tend to notice is a pattern of cause and effect. You know? and we notice, you have to be careful, see, you know? can't expect our meditation to just be like a lightning strike. Right? It's not like that. It's like planting a seed that we make grow larger. And so we start to notice these things, not just with meditation, but with the practice of morality, the practice of giving, you know, the practice of uh, meditation is the third one. We start to notice the cause and effect relationships between these things very carefully, being very meticulous, and approaching it not so much as a skeptical scientist, like, okay, things, here you are, jump in my face and prove yourself true, but approaching it more like a farmer who wants to see what the right seeds to plant are. What are the right seeds to plant? You know, how can I make these things grow? Yeah? Have this hypothesis. It is possible <laughs> to grow these things. That's what we have to start with, a working hypothesis. It is possible to make our mind peaceful. And then we look for the potentials that make them grow. And in this way, through understanding, through discernment, we get to see patterns of cause and effect. And when we start to see these patterns for ourselves, Nobody can convince us otherwise. Because we've seen them. So these are people who overcome doubt through conviction. Now when these five hindrances disappear, even temporarily when we're meditating, it doesn't have to be the case that we're, you know, you know, what we just talked about here was kind of different methods for overcoming them. But sometimes we sit down and they're just kind of not really there. And when we sit down and do this, then sometimes what we feel is a kind of pleasant sensation in the body. Kind of a, can be a kind of tingling sensation, can be other types of uh, sensations. Uh, some of the great teachers say when a person's, people's minds settle down in different ways. You know? But in any event, they're pleasant. You know, it's accompanied by when we direct our thought to an object, when we apply our thought to an object, you know, then uh, these feelings can arise. This kind of feeling that arises in what in Pali is called piti. You know, it's uh, translated as rapture. It's kind of, it's this... Uh, very, it's just a pleasant feeling. Sometimes it's a, uh, when it's strong, it's more pleasant than things we've... It's a different type of pleasantness, you know? Pleasantness in the body that also comes from the mind. You know? And this is actually the nice thing about this is this is something we can make grow. You know, this is a seed that we can water. And, you know, for a faith type, we trust the Buddha, trust the Ajans. This is something that can grow into a mighty oak tree, an immense tree that can provide a lot of shade. But if we're not a faith type, we're a discernment type, then this is a nice potential here. It's like a sprout in the plant that we can water more. See how big it grows. And this is something that we want to make grow. These feelings of pleasantness, these feelings of happiness that we get from our meditation, there's nothing wrong with these feelings of happiness. They're actually a different type of order than the normal feelings of happiness. And there's something that are not connected with sensuality, not connected with the burgers, not connected with the fries. <laughs> I could go through more condiments. Not connected with hating things, not connected with loving and getting attracted to something you know, and going out to grab it, not connected with wanting to sleep excessively, not connected with remorse, feeling bad about what we did, feeling guilty not connected with anxiety, worrying about the future, not connected with uh, restlessness, just wanting to get up and go, not connected with doubt. Is this something that really works? When it's there, we see it. Yeah. And when we see this thing, we want to make it grow, and the teachers teach us how to make it grow. So what they say is that these kind of things, this is where we notice one of the other cause and effect relationships, if we have this feeling of happiness coming up, this feeling of pleasantness in our body, then if we go and grab it and try to consume it, 
it disappears. <laughs> Doesn't stay, right? So this is where we really learn about kama and being the consumer and being the producer. It's one of the ways we learn about it. You know? When we focus in on our breath, our mind becomes more and more calm. It falls away. We learn to keep bringing it back to these things. If thought of hatred comes up, back to the breath. Sometimes you do other things to counter that too. Thought of love comes up, back to the breath. You know? Thought of sleepiness comes up. Okay, try to overcome it various ways, back to the breath. You know? Thought of restlessness comes up, back to the breath. Thought of remorse comes up, back to the breath. Thoughts of doubt come up, back to the breath. Back to the breath, back to the breath in this way, these things start to fall away. And when they fall away, what we're left with is a mind that isn't out and fettered by these other things. These other things that we think are going to give us happiness are the very things that turn around and attack us, make us unhappy. They're the very things that block our ability to have these other types of uh, happiness, which is why the Buddha says, uh, one of the reasons he says, uh, because this mind is radiant, it's defiled by defilements that come in. And kind of a, that's a really loose translation, and I have to go look up the word for word. But we cover, we obscure uh, these feelings of happiness. We cover them up when we grab on to hatred, when we grab on to sensuality, when we grab on to anxiety and restlessness, when we grab on to doubt. You know, when we grab on to a sleepiness, all these things get obscured. When they're not obscured, they come up. Now, if we're used to going out and consuming types of happiness, which of course we all are, right? Or, you know, except for the people who are uh, you know, really advanced in their practice, then the first instinct we get when the feeling of happiness is, comes up is, I want it. <laughs> you know? So we think I want it, we grab it, right? And in grabbing it, what do we do? We lose it. We forget about our breath. Right? That's what produces this feeling. So then what we learn to do is maintain our focus on the breath with this feeling there. Yeah. So this brings up another important point because usually when feelings in our life, our daily life happen, like uh, we're with people having a great time or whatever, we don't realize we're out there grabbing that. You know? That's something we're consuming. It's something we're wallowing in. And when it goes, we suffer, right? Of course, it's nice to have these good things in our life. We're not trying to be totally you know, terrible people, but the skill that we learn is even when these good things in our life, we don't grow intoxicated by them. In other words, we may remain focused on what's really important. The cultivation of wholesome qualities in our life, the cultivation of our minds. Even when good things come up outside, which all flow out, from having these good, wholesome qualities in our minds, we don't go out and eat them, you know? We remain focused on being the producer, wholesome qualities, wholesome qualities, all the time. This is our focus, either for the, for the sake of Nibbana, number one, but number two, actually, for the sake of going to heaven, which is not a bad thing, you know? This is a good thing to have as a goal. If we don't achieve Nibbana, better to fall on a cloud, <laughs> you know? It's not bad. This is actually one of the important teachings of the Buddha. To have something like this, to help see us through life dif life's difficulties, to have a goal for ourselves that goes beyond this life. A larger goal, a larger purpose. Yeah? So heaven isn't bad in that way, and Nibbana is much better. But the point is, when we have these pleasant feelings, this is a skill we learn to maintain this focus on the breath, and these feelings grow. Yeah? This feeling can grow after that. And when they grow to a certain point, what some teachers teach is you notice there's actually a disturbance in this type of feeling that arises at first. This piti, this kind of a feeling of rapture, which uh, they describe having like a shakiness to it, right? It's kind of in our body, but it can have this tingling. It's kind of tingling to it. So then after a while, if our mind, we become skilled in entering that, what the teachers teach us, you know, we become skilled in doing that all the time, they say is we have to look to refine it even more. Yeah. So what's better than this? There's this feeling of disturbance. Where's the disturbance here? You know, how can I get rid of it? And so then you learn to let go of this feeling of uh, the shakiness and try to go for something more solid. And that's when a person can go to the next, what they call, you know, to another uh, phase, what they call kind of concentration, deepen their concentration. So in this way, letting go of coarser and coarser modes of focus, going to more and more refined ones, we learn to refine our happiness. 
Yeah? This is actually an important skill, making our mind calm. Because when our mind becomes calm like this, without a lot of other disturbances, when we decide to turn our mind to objects of investigation, it's able to penetrate those objects of investigation. Yeah? It's like uh, now when I'm recording these uh, videos here, the first things I kind of, lo I looked up on the net how to record them. And one of the things they said, you, you know, you've got to have a microphone. <laughs> because if you put the recorder out there, there's all kinds of wind, there's this kind of fan here, there's, you know, sometimes if you record outside, there's dogs barking, you know, sometimes planes. This thing picks it all up. And so if I'm talking and it's over there, you hear some of the talk, but sometimes you hear you know, kind of whatever it is, like kids yelling, like, you know. So you hear all these kind of things, you can't hear the talk. You can't penetrate the talk, you can't understand what it's about. In the same way, when our minds are obsessed with loving these kind of, what they call uh, kamatanha, kind of burgers, you know, <laughs> experiences, obsessed with that, obsessed with hatred, you know, obsessed with wanting to blank out restless or sleepiness, you know, obsessed with restlessness, obsessed with remorse. When they're obsessed with doubt, all these things come in and they cloud our ability to see, our ability to focus. What is it that's making me happy? What is it that's making me unhappy? What's the cause of this? You know? Trying to ferret it out. But when we learn to make our minds settle down, then all these things disappear, more or less. The more calm our mind becomes, the more focused. And we can turn it to objects of investigation. This is where the skill that Ajahn Tanisro, uh, Tanajan Tanisro in the guided meditation teaches us learning to play with our breath, learning to ask questions, learning to direct it to different places, this is where it becomes a skill that carries over. Because what we're actually looking to do here is solve real problems in our life. What we're actually looking to do is permanently eliminate defilements. Permanently eliminate the things that make us ha unhappy. This is one of the things, you know. So what we learn to do once, we're, once our mind is settled down like that, we turn it to topics of investigation that aren't, you know, I don't usually talk, we don't usually talk about them in the meditation class, sometimes I do. <laughs> but we learn it, turn it to things like contemplation of death, you know. I'm going to die one day, you know. Everybody around me is going to die one day. Therefore, what is it important that I should be doing right now? How can I relinquish my attachment to whatever it is that causes me to die? How can I relinquish my attachment to whatever it is that causes me to be reborn? Birth and death, birth and death, over and over again. You know, swelling the charnel grounds, as the Buddha calls it. We learn to focus our mind on our own bodies. Often we look at our bodies and we think, this is me, <laughs> you know? I'm this body. Yeah? And yet, when our body grows old, we can't tell it, don't grow old. Right? Say to our body, don't grow old, it still grows old. Right? So we come down with an illness. We can't say to our body, okay, don't be ill. <laughs> it just stays ill, you know, whether we like it or not, you know. We think we're really beautiful or attractive and a lot of powers might come from whatever beauty or attractiveness comes. We say, don't become wrinkled. <laughs> don't become unattractive. And yet still it does. And when all these changes happen in our body, we suffer immensely. You know? When our body gets sick, when it feels physical pain, you know, we suffer. The reason is because in the same way we grab onto the burger, we grab onto our body and consume it. And we hold it tight. We become tied up in it. And in being tied up in it, it's like somebody who grabs onto a ship. The ship is kind of uh, in shaky water. They shake with the ship, you know. Ship sinks and they <laughs> go down with the ship, you know. <laughs> But the thing is, they grab onto the ship not knowing that they don't have to grab onto it. The reason, though, that we grab onto these things so tightly, grab onto our body so tightly, isn't just because they provide us with unhappiness. They also provide us with happiness. Yeah. These things get linked. Happiness and unhappiness. The very things we think make us happy are sometimes the things that turn around and burn us. This is something that's actually very threatening to investigate. That's why it's often not taught in just 
you know, beginning meditation classes because it can be grasped wrongly too, right? I mean, people think, you know, develop some bad body image. Okay, I'm going to contemplate my body. Now I'm an ugly person, <laughs> a terrible person. They develop kind of remorse or some hatred over your body. But this isn't just about our bodies. It's about everybody's body. It's not just us. This is everybody. It's not just us that faces death. Everybody does. So it's not something meant to be morbid. What it's meant to do is focus our minds so we can permanently cut attachment to these things. And when our mind already has a source of concentration, a source of happiness that isn't dependent on our body, you know, it's like, say, eating burgers is, like, say, going out and throwing the frisbee with the family is, you know, it's not so threatening to investigate it. Because when we learn to cultivate our minds in this way, we can investigate things that don't depend on that. This is one of the reasons why we make our mind more concentrated, try to make our mind concentrated. So we turn it to these things. We turn it to contemplation of death, investigation of the body. You know? Other things, we turn it to the contemplation of loathsomeness of food, not getting obsessed with food. You know? We turn it to thoughts of dependent origination. You know? Look, these things arise according to causes and conditions, and they cease according to causes and conditions. You know? These things are dangerous. You know? Whatever arises according to a cause and condition ceases when that cause disappears. That means if I get bound up with things that arise according to causes and conditions, I'll suffer when they disappear. How can I escape this suffering? Yeah. So this, when we investigate in this way, when we practice in this way, we build up from a sense of morality to a sense of uh, you know, giving. You know, have all these things in our heart that make our heart bright. And, you know, these are actually the things that bring beneficial things into our life anyway. You know? We learn to focus and concentrate our mind you know, so that it can drop into states of calm, can become calm. You know? And we learn actually to turn and investigate. Then we're a person who's equipped with the tools to finally cut things. You know? And this is where the true practice of Buddhism is. Or, not, true is maybe not the right word, but the unique, maybe is a better word, practice of Buddhism is. You know? It starts and builds from these things, but it turns to the very things that cause us to suffer that we can't let go of, you know? and learns to investigate them, probe them, for the sake of finding a way out. Now, when these things build in our minds, you know, they start from, I mean, of course, you know, not everybody's going to become a monk or anything like that, but they build in our minds to the point where we develop them as a skill. We feel solid and happy in our practice of morality. And we feel solid and happy in our practice of giving. You know? We feel solid and happy in our practice of concentration. These become things that give us a lot of joy. We become practice in them, people with a lot of momentum in them. Then, you know, it doesn't actually have to go in the order then, but then when we turn to investigate, we're not as threatened. So in other words, it, it builds up. It's good in the beginning. It brings all the good things people want. It's good in the middle when we learn to cultivate concentration. It's good in the end when we turn it to discernment and learn to cut these things. Because yeah. that's actually a type of happiness that we don't even imagine. Right? Can't think of it. So when we, uh, most of the time I know I have friends who are kind of addicted to uh, marijuana. Right? And they can't, they don't go on trips most of the time because it's a lot of money to have marijuana and they don't want to go anywhere without their marijuana. <laughs> can't imagine what it would be like to not have this marijuana now. Just totally addicted to it. And yet, or you know, let's take a more extreme example like crack cocaine, right? People who haven't smoked crack cocaine, look at the lifestyle of people who are smoking crack cocaine habitually. Be like, geez, I don't ever want to be like that. It looks terrible. But then for the person who's smoking crack cocaine habitually, they just cannot imagine a life without that crack cocaine. You know, it's just when they go away from it, it's just life seems terrible. You know? And yet this is the way, not just with marijuana, not just with crack cocaine, it's the way with our addiction to kamatana, sensuality, our addiction to hatred, our addiction to sloth and torpor, our addiction to restlessness and remorse, our addiction to doubt, our addiction to uh, you know, people and you know, the relationships that we have, our addiction to you know, our bodies, these are all things we feed on. And we can't imagine what it would be like to have a happiness not dependent on them. Right? And yet our sufferings are tied with them. Yeah. 
And so this is the thing that we can turn our mind to investigate. But it's not actually always necessary to do this in that order, right? Like we don't always have to make our mind calm before we investigate. Right? So actually sometimes these things even tie together in trying to make the mind calm. If we have a feeling of hatred, we have to investigate. Why, you know, sometimes where is this coming from? You know, spread metta. If the metta doesn't work, I need to try another method. Okay, what good things has this person done? Okay, can't find anything good they've done. Maybe nothing comes to mind. <laughs> then at least I have compassion for that person. You know? If compassion doesn't work, at least I have equanimity. <laughs> you know? So in other words, we keep probing. You know? We become like, uh, you know, I once, uh, you know, I see these raccoons, you know? Actually, there's a composter. <laughs> I've been in charge of compost in many places. And raccoons are extremely diligent getting into compost. <laughs> if you thwart them with one method, it works for a bit, and then they like figure out how to overcome that method. To the point where if you really want to like permanently keep raccoons out, they build these kind of sloping garbage cans with lids that have locks inside of them. <laughs> That's what finally does it. But when these kind of defilements, things that make our mind dark, that's what the kilesa, defilement, this root, the root of this word is, something that darkens our mind, makes our mind dark. We've got to investigate how to stop this from happening. You know? And that's not always going to be something that's accompanied by feelings of rapture. Won't always be something that's preceded by having a really calm mind. Right? Sometimes it's something that's unpleasant. But we've got to do it. You know, we've got to become like this raccoon. How do I overcome this? Right? Finding a way. Keep looking until maybe you know, get into the compost. And so this is why the Buddha says that for some people, they go through uh, concentration and develop discernment. Some people develop what they call discernment first. They're these people who have the discernment faculty more. They, those people sometimes start, they're, they're more inclined to these meditations where they're th contemplating death, you know contemplating, you know, the loathsomeness of food. The, these people with like a hating type personality, these types of meditations aren't, that, they're not abhorrent for them. They like, you know, they like doing that kind of thing, right? So they sometimes start with that and then develop concentration after. Some people develop them step by step, kind of like one, then the other. And then some people, their minds are just really agitated, confused, and they keep trying and then an opening opens up. It's kind of four <laughs> you know, types of people that the Buddha describes. But when we sit down to practice, we don't have to categorize ourselves in that way. What it essentially comes down to is knowing that what we're trying to do is gain in wholesome qualities. We're trying to gain in goodness. We're trying to gain in morality. We're trying to gain in concentration for the sake of making our mind happy in the here and now. That's one. Another one is for the sake of going to heaven, which is not a bad place, right? If all else fails, doing these good deeds right up to the last moment of my life I'll have a sense of safety when I die. This is a good thing. The highest purpose is for the sake of Nibbana, for the sake of completely cutting defilements entirely, for never suffering again. And all of these things, to develop them all, we develop the attitude like a raccoon, <laughs> trying to get into the compost, right? We need this happiness, you know? This is something we need. How do we get it? And that's where it's tricky, right? It's something we each have to do for ourselves. We've each got to get into our own compost bin. <laughs> Other raccoons <laughs> can kind of, you can watch them and see how they do it. At the end of the day though, it's kind of the metaphor breaks down a bit, we've got to get there ourselves. You know? So all these qualities come together. Discernment and concentration come together. Overcoming sloth and torpor, Overcoming sensuality, overcoming restlessness and remorse, overcoming doubt, all these things come together. Learning to cultivate states of concentration all come together. Whenever the time is appropriate, in whatever way, we learn to gain in wholesome qualities. And this is something that builds. You know? It's something that starts with happinesses that are small, like these kind of seeds. We look for them like a farmer. How can I make the seed grow? We keep watering it and watering it, you know? And then it grows into a huge tree, kind of like a mighty uh, mango tree. <laughs> and when it grows in that way, the metaphor kind of breaks down. But one day comes a time 
I guess when you could say, the metaphor breaks down here. But you, ideally, you, know, you can say you have a permanent source of food. In other words, but the, the real metaphor is more that you don't need to eat at all. There's just no need. There's a happiness that doesn't change. And the faith in this builds through these things, through watering the seeds, through seeing happiness grow in morality, through overcoming our defilements, the grosser ones first that seem to totally shake us off in ways that are really bad, and then more and more and more subtle, more and more and more subtle. This becomes the purpose of our life right up to the time we die and beyond. And the important thing for this is that's why we have this as our goal, having Nibbana as our goal. There's a reason to practice right to the end of our life, having heaven as our goal even. You know? There's a reason to do good. There's a reason to be around doing good, you know, gaining in happiness right to the end because there's something that comes after. You know? So in all these ways, these wholesome qualities build to things. You know? They start with happinesses that are small and build to happinesses that are greater. And they end in a happiness that never changes. So as long as we keep going <laughs> to find the compost. Okay, so I think I'll leave that for uh, your reflection. Is there, did that answer the questions? Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. did that answer the question? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, so uh, hopefully sound recorded all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have another question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Animita, some people have kind of like a, they're visual people. Some people aren't. It's the same thing, though. It's, it's something that comes when you're meditating and you're concentrating and it's something good that... So a nimitta is like a, nimitta means sign. It's the light I thought. It, you see a really bright, bright light. But maybe it's for the next time. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's one type of nimitta. Nimitta is a, means sign. That's what it means. And so people, I, some people have these, uh, they, they basically, their minds don't go out, right? Some people, their minds are more in their body. For people like this, when they sit down to meditate, they tend to experience feelings in their body. Okay. And for people who their minds have a tendency to go out and contact things, that doesn't mean like eating things. It means like there's people who have like a sensitivity outwards. When they meditate, sometimes, this is my understanding anyway, I mean, other people may say different, uh, these different, but there is a character type. When they meditate, they have these visions come up. These kind of visions, you know, they're not like a thought, like, oh, I had this memory. They're like these extremely vivid visions, more vivid than our normal sight. So some people, when they focus on their breath, the breath, what they call the breath nimitta, that comes up from focusing on that, is this kind of bright light. And so there's some meditation teachers who say, okay, now you got the bright light, you got to keep breathing, and then you, know, you eventually kind of like enter the bright light, and then you enter a state of full absorption. And there's other people who don't get that bright light at all. You know, but in either way, we've got to be like the raccoon. There's other types of nimittas too. Some people get nimittas, what they call the suba nimittas, nimittas of uh, corpses, dead bodies, which sounds really scary. But they're for the sake of... Uh, developing dispassion towards the body. Like, this is what my body's going to be like, you know? Why am I so attached to it, you know? So there's different types of nimittas. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>